My name is Regina Gloria, and I am the Director of Education here at Ragdale. You just previewed a few works of the artists Diana Fried and Maria Gaspar, two artists who have both continuously made significant contributions to this art world and beyond, both internationally and locally. Diana Fried is an artist working at the intersection of material text and textile. Her artist books and mixed media works make visible the material manifestations of language. In her work, embroidery is prominent vehicle for exploring the relationships between writing and drawing and between transcription and legibility. Fried was born in Mexico where she was first exposed to textiles as complex codes of material writing. This point of reference helps her situate her work alongside lineages that embrace long-standing connections between art and needlework and, idea, and between idea and substance. Maria Gaspar is an interdisciplinary artist whose work addresses issues of spatial justice in order to amplify, mobilize, or divert structures of power through individual and collective gestures. Through installation, sculpture, sound, and performance, Gaspar's practice situates itself within historically marginalized sites and spans multiple formats, scales, and durations to produce liberatory actions. Both artists have extensive lists of exhibitions and accolades, and it is an honor and privilege to have both of them here at the same time to share their work and vision. Deanna and Maria, thank you both for being here. And Welcome back to the virtual Ragdale campus. I think Maria, you did a residency here back in, way back in 2007, I believe. Uh, and Diana, not too long ago, back in 2019. And I thought uh, maybe you could give the audience a short background of the history between the two of you. Thank you so much, Regine, again. And thank you so much, Maria, for, for um, I, agreeing to do this with me, this conversation. Uh, Maria and I met fortuitously outside the elevator at UIC when Maria was starting her, um, her master's in fine arts. And I was on my second year of, of teaching at UIC. And while it is true that Maria was one of my students, I, I more than anything think of Maria as a peer that I look up to. She is an artist of enormous integrity and um, I just feel so happy that there are artists like you, Maria, in the world, and also that, that we can talk about art and so many other things together. So that's how we met. Yes, that's so kind of you, Diana. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for, for having us, uh, Reg and Rayo. Um, yeah, I, I uh, re recall that that moment of, of being by the elevator, and I think I said to you, you're going to be my advisor. I was very excited, especially to not only be working with, with an artist who, um, you know, I consider to be, you know, incredibly, you know, not just talented, but really dedicated to their practice and really involved in thinking about their practice as a kind of, I don't know, poetic gesture. Um, but also to see an, another um, Latina at at um, an academic institution, um, which you know is sometimes hard to find um, in in the various academic spaces that I've been involved in. Um, so I was really grateful to find someone that I connected with on many levels, uh, artistically, but also um, through 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 our connection of of you know of being Mexican, Mexican-American um, artists. So I, I'm really grateful for that um, opportunity. And now we get to, you know, work as friends and, and colleagues in various ways. And Deanna and I have had many conversations. Um, this is just a more formalized one. So it's just an extension of the many conversations we've had already. Yeah, and there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end. Um, I don't have my chat on. But um, if you want to put a question in the meantime that comes up and we can see if we can address it. But um, I think I'm going to start with um, showing you all some slides. And, and then what's going to happen next is that Maria will do the same. And then we'll stop that and, and very briefly um, ask each other some questions. And then we'll open it up for, for you all to to ask with questions if there's any. We should have planted a question, Maria. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, 
I'm going to, let's see. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to start with the artist book that um, I'm trying to diminish this. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to start with the artist book that, um, that we ended, uh, the set of slides that I showed. Um, I've been making artist books since 1993, and uh, I think it's the most consistent practice that I've had uh, for many, many years. And if you go to my website, you can see not every single artist book I've made, but the ones that are made with textiles. Um, and the, the book that, that I wanted to talk about, which was kind of a very important book for me, is called Estamina, which um, in Spanish means, I mean, I'm trying to translate it because if I say this mine, it goes into a possessive um, pronoun mine, right? Um, but it's not about something being mine. It really means this site, this book is a mine. And um, the reason why it's in Spanish is because it was part of a, an exhibition that I did in Oaxaca in Mexico that resulted from um, a, a, some research that I was doing at the library there with ancient books. And what drew me to these ancient books, I didn't know that was going to draw me, is that these books were wormholed because of how they had been the accession from monasteries and convents. And already coming to the site with a love of books and the materiality of books, instead of seeing the books as destroyed, I saw them as facts of matter. And um, there were many books that dealt with uh, classification, which is, you know, like early modernist or early modernity during the Renaissance, but how this tendency to classify the world comes from, from this period. And uh, also it's a period that overlaps with um, colonizing the Americas. So people were collecting things from all over the world. So this book, as you turn the pages, it reveals a set of stones. Stone. Yeah, inside the, inside the pages. Um, so this is what, what you see. And, um, and eventually, the, the side adjacent to the, to the pages, you, you, you see a, um, the holes. And so in this case, the holes are the, the niches in which that hold the stones. Um, yeah, this, so this is in the context of the library where it was shown um, in Oaxaca. The, the book, I think it's, it's important for me because it really stresses the, um, the objectness of books and their irreplaceability as things that um, the screen will not replace, like the screen will not replace our bodies, even though right now this book is being mediated through, through a screen. Um, and, and it's this, this, this thought that within a book, potentially it is a site for a mine, for a place where for delving into and finding something. And there is something about the, um, the wormholes um, that, that is re was really compelling to me because I'll show you, I'll show you some of the wormholes here. Um, there is a way in which these larvae, which, which delve into the books with different intentions, of course, than humans do, but they were really making these sites a space for um, thriving and living and uh, reproducing. And depending on the species of the larvae, sometimes they would stay inside the book for many generations because they need very little oxygen and water and they could get all that from the pages of the book. And if you're, if you're like me, <laughs> you might know that reading or being exposed to, to the arts, regardless of its form and, dis and discipline, it's a form of um, being nurtured deeply. And, um, and so this is what, um, what this book for me embodies, the book of the mind embodies. Of course, you know, 
people think that these books are destroyed. When I first got to the library in 2014, the librarian was very kind of ashamed of, of showing the books. And, um, and, and after a while, because you know, librarians are, are there to protect and preserve the books. But this is part of the history of these books. They're not, they were not in this condition because of how they were stored at the library. They were in this condition because of their, the moment of transition when they were moving from one place to another and there was nowhere to put them. So they were left in a basement somewhere. And that's where, the, where life, another form of life form or life force came into these works. If these were one of a kind books, it would be a mournful thing to think about. But um, because they're not, there's, you know, the Newberry has some of these books. Because they're not, there's something about them being um, really there, like unique books that, that the, the larvae and the worms collaborated in co-authoring. That's how I see them now. It's their annotations. It's like when you write something on the margin of a book and you underline it. This is where I begin to think, well, how, how can we read these books now? So I'm, I'm working now on a project, on a long-term project, where I'm looking at books, similar books in the Newbery Library, but the Newbery Library books won't have holes, so, or won't have as many holes. So there will be a way in which figuring out what words went missing or what parts of an engraving went missing. And there's very strange coincidences too. So this project, hopefully in 2023, there'll be a show at the Newbery. And, um, but it's, you know, who knows what's gonna happen with the world being in transition. And, you know, thinking about us being in a period of, um, of COVID is that their life forms that are non-human are with us all the time. And they're not malicious. They want to thrive, they want to reproduce, they want to live. And it is what happens when we intersect with them as humans that can be definitely devastating, but also we, it gives us a sense of humility of how we move through, through the world. Um, I think we should, I should stop it there. Regine, what do you think? And that we can show more images later. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the share so we can come back to Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deanna. Um, Deanna, I'm remembering the beautiful show you had at DePaul a couple of years ago where um, you, you showed some of that work. And so um, in, in the sort of Zoom format, um, it's a different experience, right, to sort of see, like, but I can still kind of feel the work, <laughs> you know, even if it's mediated through here. And I'm remembering um, the, you know, how I experienced that work at that show. Um, and then even then there was a kind of mediation there, right? I'm thinking about like all the multiple mediations that happened to sort of access this work. But anyway, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share some images on my screen as well. I'm gonna also just check the time to make sure I don't go on too long. Um, okay, uh, can you see this image? Yes. I hope, yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, just, we just have a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm giving you a really brief, um, uh, brief example of, of some of my practice. I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of the work that I make kind of on my own. And instead I'm focusing mostly on some of my most current work that involves working with others. Um, so as Regin mentioned in my bio, I am really interested in working within different kinds of uh, sites of power. And I've worked with um, many different kinds of people from young people, like in this image that you see, um, to working with families and adults. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, which has been a large part of my identity and artistic practice. Um, I have spent one can say I've spent the majority of my life working um, on the West side as an artist and also as someone involved in different kinds of community cultural practices. Um, and it, it sort of was embedded in me to kind of think about art 
in that way through my family, my grandfather and, and uncle who were part of a mariachi in Pilsen in, in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And my mother who was in community radio at a station called WCYC um, in the 1980s at the Boys and Girls Club. Now it's Yolo Kali Arts Reach. Um, so I have had this sort of longstanding kind of legacy of, of artists and cultural um, kind of people making work within uh, Chicago and thinking about art, not just as a kind of personal practice, but also the way in which it can really um, have a kind of impact on uh, an entire community and beyond. Um, you know, 26th Street is a main strip of um, Little Village. And if you've ever been to um, the South Lawndale um, on the west side of Chicago, um, you may have driven down 26th Street. It's the site of the Mexican Day Parade. It's the site of various kinds of marches. There was just recently a march, um, Latinx for Black Lives Matters, um, and many other kinds of cultural events. There's lots of shops, quinceanera stores, things like that. And I've always been influenced by um, sort of the spaces around me, buildings, architecture, the way that architecture uh, kind of influences our behavior around uh, those spaces. Um, and then beyond that, the way that uh, we kind of inhabit those spaces and the way that we're influenced by them and, um, and the way that we can kind of intervene them or push against them. So this is very early work. This is, I think, um, maybe right before, you know, graduate school, um, which is now almost, yeah, but over 10 years ago, I started to kind of think about my own body within these historical sites and integrating my body into um, these, this sort of long uh, slew of murals that exist um, in Chicago and wanting to sort of become part or embed myself um, into those images. And it's something that I've long thought about when I'm working, not just in my, my own practice, but also working with youth. Um, this is an image from a project that I ran in 2010, I believe called City as Site, where I worked with about 15 young people from North Lawndale and South Lawndale, which is predominantly you know, a black neighborhood and a Latino neighborhood um, and devising the situations to uh, to then sort of intervene within our social landscape. And it was called City as Site to really think about how the west side of Chicago has historically been um, uh, an area that has not received significant funding from, from funders, has not received the same kind of um, attention for arts and culture than you know, other parts of the city. Um, and um, this program was a way for me to really think about how we can use our landscape as, uh, as a space to sort of retell stories, reimagine stories, um, and, and really use the entire, you know, uh, city as our, our kind of performance platform. Um, so this is a piece done by Kevin, um, where we had uh, worn, you know, um, single sort of uh, color shirts, and then we're embedding ourselves into parts of the neighborhood. Um, in in 2005 or so, I began working as an arts consultant for a community organization in Little Village. And my task was to uh, help write the quality of life plan for the neighborhood, which seems like a really daunting task. And, and it was, and it was through the efforts of this local organization and many other community members that um, we had to identify what were, you know, some of the things that people wanted to see in their neighborhood in regards to arts and culture. And I think it's a really important, it was a really important moment in this particular part of the city, because now we see that happening all across the country, um, where, you know, people are, are becoming, um, are, are, are really kind of getting a space to really have more of a, of a say-so um, to really think about, you know, what people want and what's missing um, in their communities. And so during that time, I've been really thinking about all, the, all of the different sort of public spaces um, of the neighborhood. And, and through the City of Sight project with young people, um, we kept 
passing by this architecture, which is Cook County Jail. Um, you'll see that in the back, the tall buildings and the concrete wall. Um, and I started to really think about what it means to live next to the largest single site jail in the country. Um, and as someone who had been doing lots of murals as a young person, um, for me, walls have been a significant part of my practice, um, mostly used as a surface to, to do mosaics or to do, you know, paintings. Um, but then I became much more interested in the wall itself um, and how to really think not about the wall as a surface, but instead as a um, dividing line, as a border in which to remove or make porous or penetrable. This is a photograph of a carnival that takes place every summer in front of Cook County Jail on 26th Street. Um, so, you know, I did all of these studies really looking at the institution in relationship to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and have spent the last 10 years working around this, inside and around this uh, site. And um, a lot of the work has included uh, working with people outside of the jail, but um, recently working inside of the jail. And then the work that I produced there has also resulted in kind of discrete installations. This is, uh, was part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial uh, two years ago, where I reproduced the wall in one-to-one -one scale at the Chicago Cultural Center. So I'm gonna show a little clip of some of the work that um, I produced inside uh, Cook County Jail as part of a project called Radioactive, Stories from Beyond the Wall. This is the group of men that I worked with. Um, we named ourselves the Radioactive Ensemble, so I'll refer to them as the Ensemble. And um, for one year, I worked with the Ensemble to produce a series of audio and visual broadcasts that were then um, projected through live radio and uh, projected through um, images, animations onto the jail wall. So I'll show you a little clip of our project. This is sort of the final work that, um, that people ended up experiencing. There was about 35 minutes of animation and audio. So this is just a little still from the video. Um, and so I'll show you a clip of some of our process and the way we got to this point. And it illuminated by the Christmas decoration, a head swam to, into its field of vision. County has tunnels. Yeah. The tunnels can be the digestive check. The physical is the forms, right? The buildings, the concrete, the bricks. What does the space make people feel? Where are the emotions? I believe just because we're in the city, they don't want it to be a sort of people's eyes. So, so I'm going to go ahead and forward it a little bit um, since I'm running out of time. 5 FM. You're listening to Radioactive. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, but if you are interested in seeing the longer version of the video, um, you can go to um, my website, mariagaspar.com to access it. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. I know it doesn't sound very articulate to say it that way. 
<laughs> but I think that what strikes me always about, about this project is that um, it is a project that keeps generating new questions, right? And that um, I think that my experience of the, the piece at the Architecture Biennial it's many fold because on the one hand, you're looking at these textured photographs. I mean, it's not textured, but you feel a texture mm -hmm. of a space. Mm -hmm. And then when you know what the wallet is of and where you're standing in relationship to it, it flips or it oscillates into that sense of like, oh, this is here. You brought this into this space. And, uh, and yet you grew up in a neighborhood where this was there all the time. And, and it wasn't a question of, I'm going to go see it. It was like, here it is. And so, right. so I think that, that it makes us think not just about, um, you know, what is our relationship to, an, uh, to, to um, a representation of something, but it is that mm -hmm. thing, the wall of mm -hmm. a nail that mm -hmm. people are um, in some way suspended, right? Because they're in between mm -hmm. having detained and being in trial right and and so it's a space yes for many yeah years. absolutely yeah yeah I, I and I like that word that you use suspension it's such a a great a great word I think um you know sometimes people say limbo uh you know there's a, a, a period of waiting um and that waiting is filled with anxiety um, and I think suspension is, is such a great word that kind of encompasses um, the feeling of being suspended and also what suspension means. I think about suspension as punitive as well, to be suspended um, for a period of time. So it, it has a lot of these different meanings, which I like. You, you always do that, Deanna. You always <laughs> manage to find these like really amazing words of you know, vocabulary that sort of, you know, represent these different kinds of um, ideas. I mean, it puts me in the, in the shoes of, of someone who's waiting in suspense because you don't know, right? You don't mm -hmm. know. Right, as well. Right, right. That too. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to move to some of the questions that we identify that we wanted to ask each other. And, um, and I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, you're in your studio right now. Uh, your studio is really close to mine, actually. Um, uh, which is which is great. I wish we'd see each other more. <laughs> We're always busy working. Um, but I I would love to hear more about your working process because I think process is such a huge part of your practice. And you know, what does a typical workday for you look like? Yeah, um, you know, there's something about arriving in the studio which in a very different sense, there's also a sense of suspense and a sense of anxiety. Like where am I, when I'm gonna cross that membrane where I actually begin and I forget all the other list of to-dos that I have. And um, so in order to, to get started, I do little things. Like for example, I thread needles that I'm gonna use for embroidery <laughs> or um, I sweep the floor um, or I clean up a little because usually when I leave the studio is very last minute and I don't have time to clean. And then I sit down and time disappears because the kind of work that I make, I, I, I work a lot with, um, with needlework, uh, with stitching, and I'm working on many, many different things at the same time. Some of them are in the process and space of ideation. I mean, I can grab a sketchbook in a moment and show you, but that, that is a different kind of concentration where I'm coming up with an idea. And then there is some space of execution where, um, you know, I was embroidering a little bit before this, this started. Um, and in the space of execution of a work or, or realization of the parts of a work, I, I can begin to listen to other things. So I listen to, to books. I listen to podcasts, I listen to music, or sometimes I just listen and I mean, I don't play anything and I really want to listen the sound of the needle going in and out of the cloth but it, because it is like breathing. So in some way, um, my process in the best of moments, I like to say, when that anxiety goes away, it is like meditation and um, it is like, um, like breathing. 
you know, that in and out of the thread, in and out of the cloth. I mean, I don't only work with thread, but my, my work does involve a lot of repetitive actions. Um, and then, you know, that when I speak about ideation, ideas, um, I feel like the world is a different world right now than it was in January. I mean, personally, it's a different world for me. And so works that I started before January, they are now, um, you know, something else is coming into them. So, um, for example, this here is from a piece that, that it's multi-part. It's, it's going to be a large piece, but because of the embroidery, I'm working at, on it in parts. And originally, it just had the parts of letters, kind of in that image that, um, one of the images that Regine saw, showed. But, um, and, the, and the letters coming together were going to form a, a, a very short phrase, singing, song, singing. But um, why I wanted to embroider that phrase, um, it was coming from something I read in a poem by Bertolt Brecht, which he's, the poem is called Moto, and it's basically just a very short poem. And it goes, it, said, it goes, in the dark times, will there also be singing? And so this is like, will there also be part? <laughs> will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, there's many ways of defining dark times, but um, I do want to keep singing, you know? So maybe that's, that's something about, about the process too, you know, that, you know, that my, my work um, operates on a level that is not illustrative, of, of the idea, so my, the people who see the work will have to do many levels of work um, if they want to, but if they don't want to, they will have an encounter with a sensual material object that hopefully for them, there's an element of pleasure and joy in that too. I mean, of course, we all have very different sensibilities and it may resonate more with someone than, than another, but, um, I don't think art is necessarily there to be understood intellectually first. And if it can have, um, you know, it can have that. There's many ways of entering an artwork. But because the, the, the ideas behind my work are layered, I don't want people to think like, I don't get it. You know, I mean, some people will. <laughs> but, um, but there is also that just, just letting yourself go into something that is materially present there. That, that is a way of accessing a work too without having to speak or having to have a, like, know what does it mean? Because it means many things. Yeah. You had a show recently at um, Alan Coppell Gallery uh, last fall? Is it last, yeah. last year? No. Yes, last year fall. And um, I remember I took my class to your show and you got to, to talk about it to my students, which was really beautiful. Um, and you talked about pulling text from the New York Times obituaries. Can you just sort of talk about, I mean, it's like how you identify which text and then how do you sort of organize all of that text to then eventually make its way into your work? Because I'm interested in like, how do you go from that to then the final piece? Um, is it okay with everyone if we go a little bit over time? Because I have a lot of questions for Maria. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, if, I'm, if, if you all got, have to leave, that's, um, you know. I totally am. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Re Regin said, yeah, right? Okay. Yes, for um, as long as you can. Well, I mean, I don't want to abuse the time, anybody's time, but um, I'm going to show my screen again. And, um, and I'll, I'll talk, I'll just refer to what Maria um, described. Um, so here are sources from the New York Times, um, uh, the New York Times from the Words from Obituary series. And, um, you know, the, I guess the selection also reflects what kinds of obituaries, long-form obituaries, the New York Times deems uh, important enough, whose obituaries are important enough. And over the last few years, there's been a corrective. Um, 
in New York Times, but my my research involves that fact that there's mostly men from New York <laughs> who are being, you know, memorialized or, or people in some kind of power. But for example, here is um, the obituary of Simin Bebahani, who was an Iranian poet. Her work has been translated into, into, um, into English. And um, I think I saw Jim Lee as part of the um, audience members because she and I exchanged the, re what the work that resulted from this piece with one of her beautiful photographs. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I cannot make it larger. I guess I could if I, if I knew how to zoom this, but um, the, I read the entire obituary and I read a lot of obituaries and there, there's not always something I can find, but um, I first circled surprise to find it had been written by a woman. And then I took out the word surprise and, to, and, I, and it became to find it had been written by a woman. And um, in this series, Words from Obituaries, what ends up happening, and you can read a little bit about the system, is that these pieces then get transcribed, these little fragments in the obituary, they get transcribed into, into the, into the, um, the work. So it's embroidery on, on graphite, what you see behind this graphite. I don't do it in the order. I don't, I don't embroider on the graphite. The graphite comes later, but it just helps you visualize what you're looking at. It's a, it's a piece of paper with graphite uh, on which the letters sit. And I created a color system um, by which to um, organize, classify um, the words from obituaries. And it's a very subjective, flawed system. All systems of classification are flawed. There's no way they can work because no person is one thing. But um, the, um, anybody who works with language, like Simin Bebahani, she was a, an author, a poet, they're going to be pink. Anybody who's an artist but not a writer, they're going to be orange. Uh, healers and doctors are going to be blue. Uh, people who are not artists but are public entertainers of some kind, like athletes and circus. I guess circus people would think of themselves as artists, but here is where my system is flawed. How people define themselves would not be how I would define them. And because this project is not about honoring, it's about acknowledging that everybody dies, everybody has a different death. Not everybody gets to have um, a good death, but um, it, it, it involves people who are not just um, heroic, but it also has people who committed crimes against humanity or war crime. So like this guy who died at, at the age of 95, peacefully in his sleep, um, Polasoresis, and so the, the 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 words that I pulled out are played down the ugliness, and um, so the the war criminals are in gray. That's the color that um, that I assigned to them, and so this is an ongoing project. The first piece I made was in 2010, right after my dad died. So I think I I was thinking about like no life is reducible to one story, and yet there's something that um, that stays. And because these are public figures, I would never use the, well, they're not, some of them are super famous and some of them I just learn about through the sources, but um, the public figures, so, so in that sense, they are, um, they are, I mean, they're, they're published, they're, they're obituary is published in a, in a, in a public space. Um, so then I am able to access what, what, is, what somebody else wrote in summation of their lives. But here, this one on this side, you see the notices. And these are personal ones that friends and family post. They pay the New York Times to post them. Whereas Shakuntala Devi's, somebody thought, and I'm glad they did, that she should be given her own obituary. And, um, and I never heard about her before. Most people in this series I've never heard about before. And she was somebody who could make very fast mathematical calculations. She was born in India. So she could make, she could make a lot, I mean, that was a parenthesis there. She could make a long, um, very, very complex mathematical calculations in the time it took 
to ask the question. So, um, so let me find her. So here, here is hers. Um, and she's not a, she's not a, an a quote, artist making objects or dances or, um, or architecture. She's making a form of public um, appearance. And, and so she's purple, just like athletes. Um, and here you can see in the time it took to ask the question. And, and these are meant to be read slowly so that if you wanted to figure out what it says, it would take time because there's no space between the words. Sometimes like words get broken in the, in a, in, in, at the end of a space. Like, so the word, the T-H-E is broken. And so it's also a way of thinking about in, the, in, in how I want to think about material text, um, about codes of, of language. And I think that maybe because, not just because I was born in Mexico, but I was always drawn to textiles and how they are coded. The clothing we're wearing is a code. And a lot of um, early weaving, um, and not just, not so early weaving, that people would wear as garments are, are truly coded um, texts in a way that tell something about where that person is from and what they're trying to say. So I hope that um, that answers somewhat Maria's question. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I've always enjoyed the, um, the sort of intricacy of, of the sewn elements onto that graphite, which graphite appears so often in your work and the kind of shimmer that the graphite gives off, whether it's the smaller, well, I forget what size, smaller eh, <laughs> to then larger installations on walls um, that you use. Um, and I, I love this idea of the fragment because I think about the fragment a lot too, or being feeling fragmented um, or working with fragments Mm -hmm. um, but in a, you know, slightly different way, maybe more in a sort of, I think about it, like, in terms of, um, like, a pedagogical sense, too, because, um, well, because, you know, I, I teach um, at an art school, but then I also, I think about pedagogy in my work with others, because I have a teaching practice, and because I think that um, one of my tools has been you know, uh, the, the, the sort of skills I developed through teaching then make their way into my artistic practice. And, you know, for Radioactive, uh, for example, which is the video I showed a little while ago, um, you know, I, I incorporated a lot of teaching in that. And I had to work with situations that were very fragmented, whether it was like showing up at the jail um, to, to run my series of workshops and um, finding out that the jail was in, in a lockdown and I had to wait to get in or um, fragmentation in the sense that someone spent, the ensemble member was there for three weeks and then they left or, or who knows, um, they were put in solitary or these sorts of fragments that then one has to sort of work with. And it's, it's difficult to do a series of workshops that have any kind of length of time because you're working within a space that um, is about, like you said, suspension and, and sort of this feeling of limbo at the same time. It's, it's, yeah, like anything can happen really fast. And, and one of the challenges that, that I had um, and my collaborator had was how do we create something consistent and that felt cohesive in working with an institution that really thrives in fragmentation, you know, that, that really is, is, you know, really meant to work in that way. Um, <clears throat> so that was one of the challenges that, that we had. And I think a way that we were able to sort of, and it wasn't perfect either, right. Um, that we were able to work around it was that, that, you know, creating a space where everybody sort of participates and makes something that potential, sorry, that might be my, my crying toddler in the other room, um, <clears throat> but that, you know, someone might uh, write the narrative and then one of the ensemble members does the drawings or that person does the drawings and the other person writes the narrative. And then there was this, there was this understanding that um, we would all work on these different pieces um, just given the circumstances. And so I think that um, that, that sort of parameter um, in a sense, kind of helped bring something together 
which yeah yeah <laughs> oh i think you're on mute diana it, that makes me think that fragmentation that also makes me think that when 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 you're in a space of suspense and you have a fragment that is going to meet another fragment that it also gives you something to look forward to now you're muting yes absolutely yes yeah absolutely. i mean i think that's why also i have always loved working in I mean, you know, even even when I teach in, in my academic institution, I really enjoy um, working from a place that, that is about, um, uh, you know, and I guess that's that's just, you know, process and like really getting deep into a process and responding to that process and really trying to respond to what is there. Um, and and um, that that is really exciting. And there were these moments with the Radioactive Project where we would be developing something and, and talking and, and drawing. And then all of a sudden it was this like, you know, what I always think about is like this really weird space that we would get into this really amazing artistic creative space. And, and I, you know, and it was this many moments where we didn't know where this was going to go. And that was so exciting because it felt like, a, it felt like, you know, this is why I do this, right. Or this is why we're all, I, I think that's why, you know, art and culture is, is so much a part of our human I identity or humanness um, is because it allows us to imagine, to, um, to express ourselves, right? That in ways that, um, you know, unfortunately our, our society sort of suppresses in many ways. And so when those moments happen, when those sort of weird, amazing moments happened, it felt, it felt phenomenal. And and even though we didn't know where that would lead or we, you know, maybe that didn't necessarily um, resolve in a sort of thing at the end, it didn't matter because it was about that, that engagement, you know? Yeah. I think that yeah. answered the question that I wanted to ask you, why do you do what you do? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw that Regine sent the note that um, we could, we could stop our conversation around now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's more questions that, I, that uh, Maria and I could ask each other, but um, I wonder if anybody would like to, um, to ask us something and you could perhaps unmute yourself or send us a chat if you want to ask us something. Um, if, is there, uh, if there are any questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paulina. Thank you so much, Diana and Maria. Um, I have a question for you all. Hi. Um, I was really intrigued, Diana, by what you mentioned earlier about um, kind of the affectual resonance of your work and kind of like um, not having multiple kind of like entry points into your or the desire to have multiple entry points into your work and not it, it always being like through the intellectual. And I'm wondering if both of you might be able to speak to some of those like um, effectual or like other sensorial kind of um, processes, not only in your own practice um, and in like also in your decision making of like your, 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 your personal process, your personal practice of like how your editing process works through a multisensorial possibly or like an affectual kind of resonance, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love the question. You know, that question makes me think of love. You know, when I'm also an educator, and um, I, I, there's a question I ask my grad students in the last few years, uh, because they get stuck or they get like scared because they're gonna be presenting their work in critique and, and they're gonna be, have to defend their work. And I always say, ask them, what do you love? You don't have to tell me. You have to know. What do you love? And that is not, not a compromise. Whatever it is that you love, you're not compromising that. And, and that will guide your work more than any critique. Obviously, you know, you're a self-reflective person who, who's going to have your own self-criticism and your own editing methods, but not self-editing. That's not editing and not editing before you start. And so in relation to that, um, 
I mean, sometimes I'm surprised by what the work tells me to do. You know, um, of course, you know, we're talking about an inanimate object, but part of what art is, it animates something, it gives anima, giving soul to something. Anima, I think it's Latin for soul. And so um, for me, that affective space uh, comes from paying attention, not just to, to what I'm doing, but it comes from paying attention to what the work is doing as I'm doing it. And, um, you know, it, it also comes from ideas and I and like trying to get myself in some territory that is emotional in some ways. Um, whether the work, I mean, sometimes the work is very still, but a lot of my work is about death and time. And uh, not in a morbid sense all the time, maybe sometimes, but, but I think that, that that question of time, the human time being very limited, it already asks us, like Mary Oliver asks in her poem, what are you going to do with this, just this one precious life? And so already from there, there's an affective uh, prompt. What you love and what you're going to do in your one precious life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your question, Paulina. And um, Paulina and I know each other since high school days. So. <laughs> And who's a, a, an amazing artist and educator herself. So thanks for ask, asking such a thoughtful question. Um, yeah, I love Deanna's answer around love. I think that's, uh, that resonates with me a lot. Um, I think I have thought a lot about, um, you know, like this idea of uh, architecture that is haunting or places that haunt. And, and you know, I'm thinking also about all of the conversations we're having now about monuments and um, uh, and you know these these monuments that that haunt you know that represented uh, certain kinds of um, tra that represent traumas um, in our history um, and I I think about you know sites and the kind of power that they have and that these sites have that that I think of them as sort of these these holders of energy and the way they sort of um, they have a ripple effect um, in relation, you know, especially in relation to the jail, for example, and, and having grown up a few blocks away and, and thinking about, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of psychological, emotional, political, social um, traumas that, that that place sort of um, creates, you know, and it, and it evolves and it just sort of recreates in these different ways, you know, so it recreates that trauma. Um, I've also been thinking a lot about, um, you know, uh, it's funny, I, I was listening to this talk between Fred Moten and Stefano Harney recently, it was called like, about the university, I don't know, maybe you saw that. And, um, I'll have and it's something that's chat. been on my mind. Yes, good. Yeah, it's really, really great. And, um, you know, and I, I love what they had to say. And one of the things that they were talking about was, um, I think that's one of the, maybe I made it up, but I was thinking about antagonism and like, I was thinking about how in my, at least in my practice, um, that, you know, I enter these spaces with a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of complicity because I work with these institutions that, you know, like I go inside the jail and I, I, I work with, people who are detained and there's a system that detains those people. So one can argue that there's a certain kind of um, complicity there, you know, just, and one of the terms that they were talking about was something called radical complicity. And I love that idea because it makes me think about the ways in which um, one can, or an artist can or whoever can kind of interrupt uh, something, you know, can interrupt a system, can detourn a system, can subvert something. And, and I think that's sort of a space that I work in a lot. And I think it's because of this sort of early, I think it was because of my early art education around murals and the way that they, you know, either interrupted something or lifted something up that they, they, they were, you know, they were really, they have been really good at doing that. And so 
I find myself in that same kind of position in, in some ways. And, but I struggle with that a lot, you know, um, you know, and, you know, is it, is it, this is sort of, you know, is it a, a kind of antagonistic standpoint? Well, not necessarily, but there, there, but that is embedded in, um, in sometimes a sort of um, viewpoint or relationship. And it sounds really negative maybe, but, but, um, but I think it's about high stakes. You know, it's like something is high stakes. It, it's not all about sort of being easy and pretty, you know, um, it's about something unfolding and being difficult. And it's like going through the weeds of something. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in how artists um, and other kinds of culture workers move through those spaces and come up with these interesting strategies and um, methods that, that kind of detour those things. Cause I do think that at the end of the day, like, you know, Augusto Boas always says, right. The, like, it's, it's the pra it's a rehearsal. It's like a practice for like the revolution. <laughs> so, and I love that idea of sort of that we can practice that together um, towards something bigger. Thank you. So I, I hate to interrupt. This is such an amazing conversation and, you know, we could go on for the next several hours, but I do want to uh, give the two, Maria and Diana, an opportunity to, to close it out with anything that you'd like to say, um, but we are gone a little bit over. And so if there's anything you'd like to add to finish it off, I'd like to give you that opportunity. Um, I mean, you're right, Regin, that, that you can keep going in, in, in this. And I, um, you know, I, I learn a lot from when I, when I hear Maria talk about her work and when I look at her work. And um, I want to urge everybody to go to her website because her practice is very full. There's many different approaches to questions. And, um, you know, and so far that, I mean, Maria, that, that there's, a, there's a public art that you make, and I use that term broadly, um, and is a yes, and there's also work that arises from uh, a contemplative paying attention to other things practice. So, you know, I think it's interesting that, um, that, um, that you can do these two things in such a beautiful, complete way. So I just wanted to say that. And um, I don't know if anybody else has a question. Um, I'm happy to, to um, you know, stay a couple more minutes to answer, but um, there were questions we didn't get to ask each other to be continued. Maybe. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Diana for inviting me to have this more formal conversation with you and yeah, uh, to be continued for sure. And thank you, Regin and Ragdale for inviting us to, to be part of this. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone for your time and attention today. I hope you enjoyed the creative POV artist talk today. As I mentioned in the chat, it has been recorded so it'll be available for reviewing uh, soon after this conversation ends. And then we're also going to be putting together uh, teaching guides that will be added as supplements on our website. So check out ragdale.org. And of course, you can always look further into the work of both Diana and Maria on their websites, dianafried.net, correct? And mariagaspar.com. Uh, the next POV artist talk will be next week, July 24th with Alice Hargrave at 11 o'clock, followed by uh, fiction writer Kathy Fish at 1 p.m. So we hope you'll join us then. Uh, but until then, have a great day. Thanks again, Diana and Maria. Thank, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Regin. Thank you, everyone, for taking time from your late morning to come hear us and be with us. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>